appears. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our May 24th open mic for the League of Vermont Writers. We're very happy to have three featured readers tonight and wonderful readers in between. So I think we have a great night ahead. And uh, just to sort of get us started with the rain today, I've been thinking about memories having to do with rain. And I had this memory I hadn't thought about in a long time where there was just this really dramatic lightning storm. And when I was a kid, we had all kind of gathered around the picture window when we were looking outside, even though my mother didn't want us anywhere near the window because lightning, you know, in her mind was going to come through and strike all of us. And in fact, across the yard, it struck a tree. So that was a really dramatic memory that I had and it just sort of came back to me. So let's begin with Ellie Bryant. And Ellie, if you'd like to introduce yourself and the piece you're reading and then share a nice rain memory that you've got, and any other interesting bio information you feel you'd like to share with us tonight? <laughs> rain, uh, rain memory. Oh my gosh, I didn't think about that. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be uh, reading tonight from um, my forthcoming book. And I really thought I'd have the books today, but UPS tells me they're coming tomorrow in a box. But I have a picture of the cover here. Is it backwards? No. Okay, it's backwards to me. It, it is, but um, that's okay. We can oh, wait. still see. It's upside down. <laughs> upside down, yeah. There we go. There we go. Sheltering Angel. Excellent. Oh, well, I'm really prepared. No, I have not had a glass of wine yet, but I will. <laughs> I can save that um, for afterwards. <laughs> Um, I guess a rain memory would be camping and oh no, I know what it was. It was uh, helping a friend move his father's uh, big boat from Montreal down into Lake Champlain. And, um, <sighs> and it rained the whole time and I loved it. Being out on deck in the rain and pulling that boat through the locks and oh gosh, it was just so great. I love getting dirty and wet. I don't know what it is about me, past life stuff. But anyway, um, I, you know, I don't like writing about myself very much. I like writing about other people. So um, this story, Sheltering Angel, uh, actually, I've been hearing this story for years from my mother-in-law, um, and it's based on the story of her grandmother uh, and, her, and her grandfather. Her grandparents were in first class on the Titanic, and um, they built this relationship with their um, their steward on the Titanic, who was a Scottish guy whose, whose clan in ancient times was allied with um, my mother-in-law's uh, great ancestors who were Scottish. So uh, <clears throat> that's what I'm going to be reading from. And I, I've been working on this book for about eight years and finally it, it had, if this makes you feel any better, it had at least 150 rejections from agents and publishers before. I just decided to send it to the publisher that I've been working with for the last few years. I had that all set up in a fellow so, um, which is Black Rose Writing. And they've been, they've been very good to me and they're sort of a hybrid press. Um, and if anybody's interested in uh, Black Rose, I can talk to you more about that at some point. Um, but I'm gonna read um, a little bit from, can you see that? Anyway, I want you to be able to see it. Perfect, it's, it's perched it's right called, there. Um, he wanted me to call it, the, the editor wanted me to call it um, a novel based on a true story of the Titanic. Uh, but interestingly, the first third of the book is about Florence Cummings, who's telling the story, and um, and it alternates between her voice and the voice of the steward as a young man. So you sort of in the first third of the book, you get to know them, so you understand what's at stake for them when they get on the ship. Um, and there's a little bit of love and and a tiny bit of sex, and uh, it's all very tasteful, hopefully. So she starts off the book by <clears throat> with a little introductory note and her voice is always in first person and Andrews is in third person. 
She says, every age is a tragic age. Wars kill youth, disasters maim the living, and storms sink great ships. We cling to our meager blessings and to those left for us to cherish. But it was not always so for me, Florence Thayer Cummings. In what seems so long ago, it must have been another life. There was feasting and laughter. There was joy. That life was before the cruel night under a starry universe. My beloved was ripped from my side. Only the friendship of one humble man gives me courage to travel back to the time before the iceberg. <laughs> and then every chapter starts with a headline from a newspaper of that particular period in 1912. Um, we'll start with Andrew's voice. And the headline is, in near mishap, SS, SS New York almost rams HMS Titanic at launch from the New York world, uh, April 10th. <clears throat> Andrew went to the boat deck to watch the train roll in. This is um, when the Titanic is still uh, docked. The boat deck held officers' quarters, an open promenade, the captain's bridge, and wooden lifeboats. He counted 48 davits, but only 16 held lifeboats. The company's chairman must have wanted to keep the deck clear so passengers could walk unobstructed in the fresh air. 16 lifeboats would hold 1,000 passengers and crew, even though 2,000 or more were expected to board. Of course, if some disaster were to happen, another ship would surely come to the rescue. But White Star shipbuilders had engineered a seaworthy vessel. He had no choice except to believe it. It was a gray day with a nippy breeze, but despite the threatening web weather, all classes of people had gathered on the Eastern dock, some bustling, some sauntering, some ruffled and cheeky. Andrew looked down at men's heads topped with bowlers, skimpy brim trilbies, and the flat caps of commoners. Rich women flaunted Parisian chapeaus a quiver with feathers, and poor women clutched hand-knit shawls over their heads. All of them chattered as they prepared to board the boat. What they had in common was the largest moving man-made object in the world and the vast ocean they were about to cross. And then we'll switch to Florence's uh, voice. And this takes place in, uh, she didn't board in Southampton where the ship began. She boarded in um, Cherbourg, France because they had been vacationing in France. And um, so they're waiting to board what they think is the Oceanic. And the headline is, the great coal strike begins from the Daily Mirror, April 10th. <clears throat> Breakfast in France is a disappointment. Bradley stared at his tartine. Would it kill them to soft boil an egg? Le petit déjeuner is the least important meal of the day, darling, I said. Most French skip it and eat a big lunch. Try dipping your tartine into your coffee. The French either were too busy running late uh, to sit down to breakfast, or perhaps they like to postpone gratification. My husband derived gratification from lingering over coffee in order to absorb the latest news, mostly news of financial matters. I admit the sliced baguette and butter and jam seemed like a waste of time, but we had the time to waste while we waited to board Oceanic. Besides, the cafe au lait was delicious. I allowed my gaze to wander to the window and the harbor outside. The sky is red this morning, I said. What's the saying? Mm, he buzzed. The saying about the red sky in the morning. Sailors take warning. He didn't bother looking up. We're scheduled to sail today in just a few hours, in fact. I'm afraid not. What do you mean? It says here there's a coal strike affecting England and all of Europe. A coal strike? I hoped the strike wouldn't reach New York. At least spring was blossoming and there would be no need for heating coal within the next several months. Worse news, darling. Most cruise ships have been docked. Not enough fuel to not enough coal to fuel the engines. Oceanic is one of those out of commission. But we have tickets for the Oceanic. 
He folded the paper and laid it next to his plate. We may be stranded in Europe for a while. Bradley, we've got to get home. The boys are waiting for us. There must be some way. He looked at me, his face without humor. There is one slim chance. A, a new white starship has been allowed enough coal for a transatlantic crossing. How new? He glanced at the article again. If you're willing to book passage on the maiden voyage, we can leave tonight. I, heard, I had heard cautions against maiden voyages. At the very least, there would be wrinkles to iron out. I didn't want to think about the very worst. Is there a risk? Folklore, Flory, every ship has to have a first launch, and very few of them have ended up in Davy Jones's locker. His eyebrows arched with optimism. In fact, a first crew is always a festive affair with parties flowing with champagne, and you might spot a celebrity or at least an executive. A maiden voyage on a white star ship will win you bragging rights for years. I didn't need bragging rights. I wasn't a bragger. I just wanted to be home. What's the name of this new ship? I believe it's, he ran a finger over the newsprint, RMS Titanic. Titanic, I repeated. I drew a deep breath and blew it out. And a red morning sky. If there's a storm, we should be away before the, but we should be away from the quote coast before it lands, he patted my hand. Don't worry, darling, we have a few hours yet. Why don't you write another letter to our boys while I see about tickets? My dear sons, France is beautiful in the spring. We loved the palace at Versailles, Monet's gardens at Giverny, the medieval architecture of the Loire Valley, riverboats on the Seine, Daddy and I had a boat ride, and above us Notre Dame glowed with light and looked like a saintly castle. There's so much to see, and I know you will one day, and read about it in your school books, too. I trust you are behaving and studying hard. Your father and I want to hear all about your adventures when we return. Very soon we will board the ship Titanic, named for Titans, the giants who ruled the earth until Zeus and the Olympians overthrew them. I'm sure you know the story from your lessons in mythology. As I write, across the harbor, the ship's electric lights look like a constellation of stars fallen from heaven onto the water. I am willing Titanic to sprout wings and fly across the ocean with all speed. Oh, how I miss my sweet boys. Vous êtes la joie de ma vie, Maz. So that's it. That's about. They called wow. her, Mars, and thank goodness she didn't bring the boys on the trip, uh, or mm -hmm. else my husband wouldn't be here. <laughs> Those were his great grandparents. So, wow. um, you know, if you ever have interesting ancestors to write about, um, it's always very gratifying to learn about the world around them. You know, World War Two, World War One was about to break out, um, and so they were even cautious about taking a cruise because you know that could have happened at any minute it's lovely how the tension was so high because we all sort of know where this is headed but it was also very pleasant to be sitting there having the breakfast so well, thanks for I, sharing that yeah I, w I wanted you to like Bradley because he you know he ends up not being part of women and children first and Mm. I think I'm giving it away by telling you he did not make it, and he's at mm. the bottom of the sea with the with the rusting boat. Wow. You must have done a lot of research to support this. Case. I know so much about the <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, a friend of mine, I think, also is getting published by Black Rose Press. Her name is Don Reno Langley, and she, I, th I think that's who just accepted her this past February too. So it sounds like oh, a good publishing. Mm -hmm. thing. Is it in Texas? Is is it the one in Texas? Yeah, it's outside yes. of Austin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah same no, place. San Antonio, I'm sorry. And they don't accept everybody. Uh, you know, a woman in my writing group was rejected. So mm -hmm. they're getting... No, I, they're very selective, she said. So she was thrilled, yeah. too. So she's got a, a novel coming out from them, too. Well, good for her. Right, well, thank, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's exciting. This is my thank fourth so novel with them. So, wow. 
Yeah, I, I mean, they're really, really great to work with. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for sharing. Thank and you. now we have Celia Riker, and I'm looking forward to hearing your work. Can you share with us about rain, Celia? Is she okay, I'm, look I, I'm not sure I'm looking let's see let's see I'm looking through our list do we have Celia here maybe she's not present okay so um, let's go ahead and move on if she joins us we'll have her to read at a different moment we've got Kathleen McKinley Harris take it away Kathleen Oh, okay. Kathleen, are you muted? Let me see if I can unmute you. Let's see. I can't see myself. There you go. You're perfect. There you oh, are. You're lovely right. and radiant. There you <laughs> are. <laughs> Great. Last year during the COVID crisis, the whole of Mutton Hill in Charlotte was in, in veiled in rainbows and rain. And it, it was a, a lovely moment. So I, I'm not sure whether this is a, a picture book text or a short story. And I, I do it in honor of my brother who, younger than I, who died just before uh, St. Patrick's Day. And this is based on memories that he told me about. He grew up in Hyde Park, Vermont. So here goes. Poe Crow, every Saturday, Jay drove to the town dump with dad. In winter, the trees at the dump were black with hungry crows that flew away whenever a car or truck drove near. One foggy, damp April morning before the gray snow banks thrown up by the snow plows had melted, on the weekly dump trip, Jay spotted a black thing by the edge of the road. At first, Jay thought it was an old hat or shoe somebody had lost, but it might be a crow. Whatever it was, it didn't move or fly away. Stop the car, Jay, Dad, Jay yelled. It was a crow, and something was wrong with it. Jay ran back to pick up the crow, but it fluttered up and flew 25 feet towards the woods. Each time Jay was close enough to grab the crow, it fluttered up and flew a few feet. He finally caught it in the woods. He held the crow tightly, wings against its body. It was very thin. He saw its leg was broken high up in the hip almost in the main part of its body. It's full grown, Jay said. The crow, weak from its efforts and injury, lay still in his hands. I had quite a chase. He fixed a warm place for it with the fireplace screen, boxes, newspapers, and rags on the kitchen door near the back door, on the kitchen floor near the back door. He laid the crow down on its good side. What shall we feed it, Mom? Jay asked. He may not trust you enough to eat, but try some raw hamburger, son. Maybe a little popcorn or oatmeal. Maybe some fruit. Crows eat almost anything. Carefully, Jay put a bit of hamburger near the crow's beak. The crow opened its eye and turned its head. 
but it didn't eat. Jay tried a jar lid of water next. The crow drank it all and several more. After a rest, it raised its head and gobbled up the hamburger, popcorn, oatmeal, and fruit. Then it began to yell, caw, caw, for more. He's going to live, Jay said. He's smart. He knows I want to help him. Although he snapped his beak at Jay's hand, he ate and drank everything Jay brought. Soon he was strong enough to stand on one leg and caw for more food. But he never flacked his wings much, and he didn't try to fly over the fireplace screen. His name will be Poe, said Jay on one of his, of his food trips. Now I have to do something about his leg. Jay phoned, phoned the veterinarian. Doc Walker, I have a sick crow. He's got a broken leg, the vet said. A sick cow? No, said Jay. Not a cow, a sick crow. Oh, I've never had a crow as a patient. I don't think I can do anything ab about the crow's broken leg since it's so far into its body. The crow will have to mend as best he can without medical help. Yukon, Jay's Malamute pup, hated crow from the first. Whenever Yukon was invited into the kitchen, there was the crow. Once the dog lunged at Poe and knocked over the fireplace screen, the crow hopped out of reach. Bad dog, scolded Jay, and he hustled Yukon out. As Poe healed, he no longer pulled into the corner when Jay came. He wasn't a fussy eater. After a few days, Jay's mom began to complain. I don't like that big odorous bird in my kitchen. And I don't like that bird's eyes on me. He watches every move I make. His eyes seem intelligent. It's almost as if that bird knows what I'm thinking. So Jay moved Poe into his bedroom. Poe continued to gain strength. He still dragged the hurt leg, but he became a cocky, demanding bird. Jay began to wonder whose bedroom it was. Why, he couldn't even ask his dog in for a visit. Jay knew he had to do something. A bedroom was no place for a bird as big as a crow and as smelly. Jay talked over the problem with Dad. The snow was gone. Pastures were greening up. The bird was strong and glossy. They figured if Poe could fly, he'd be all right. Early the next morning, Jay heard crows cawing in the white pines. He carried Poe outdoors. He stroked the crow and put him down. Go on now, Poe. The crow didn't look back. He flapped his wings, lifted himself into the sky. Poe joined the other crows. Jay watched them until he could see them no longer. Then he went into the house. But sometimes, when Joe, Jay sees crows flying overhead, he sees one of them has a leg that sticks out at a funny angle. Sometimes that crow leaves other crows and lights on a big hemlock near the back door. Then his black shadow appears closer, driving the little birds away. Alone and unafraid, Poe comes down to the bird feeder. Sometimes, too, while Yukon sleeps in the sunshine, head on his paws, that crow Poe lands on the dog's dish 
and helps himself to leftover dog food. The end. Oh, that was delightful. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Wow. What a, what a visual story. And it felt very Vermont. And I'm picturing if it were a kid's book that Mary Azarian's art would be really beautiful with it. Well, <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Kathleen. All right, welcome. Cindy Bogard, our featured writer. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cindy Bogard from Montpelier. Uh, my I could tell a million thunderstorm stories because I grew up in Wisconsin, as you might be able to tell from my accent. And so we had thunderstorms all the time, but I mostly remember Superstorm Sandy. I was living uh, uh, 150 feet above uh, Long Island Sound on a cliff during it. And um, the waves were huge and everyone was afraid that we would, uh, our, our houses would fall into the sea. They did not but we lost electricity for three weeks. But what I remember the most is two squirrels took up residence in a birdhouse that we had next to our window. And the whole time we we like crawled out of the hallway and went to look at the window quickly and to, to see the two squirrels. And they were, they made it fine through the storm. Um, so I'm gonna be reading, um, this is my debut novel. Um, it's called The History of Silence, and I only have a, um, it was published in March. Let's see if I can make that make any sense. There we go. By Atmosphere Press. It's my debut novel. Um, and uh, I'll just uh, start now. Um, oh, I should mention my website. In case you're interested, CynthiaJBogard.com. A Lost Love, A Secret Life, A Mother's Longing, <laughs> and A Murder. Four women unknowingly bound together by one man's violent slaveholding past. Prologue. A Pine Hill Station, Texas, March 1986. Maddie. Professor Johnny Wharton V had finally found the ultimate way to keep us all talking about him. He'd gotten himself murdered bled out all over the expensive Persian rug that graced the floor of our, his spacious office. Stabbed to death with the office scissors, I had heard from our department secretary, Maria, her voice hushed and excited. He had kept, stupidly, some early Roman antiquities and coins in his office. No one knew what had happened to them. Even in death, the man had a huge ego. His funeral had to be held in an architecturally interesting, historically important church built circa 1855, the oldest Southern Baptist church in Pine Hill Station, built by pioneers or possibly slaves. Johnny wasn't religious as far as I knew, but then I'd gone out of my way not to know him. Johnny's last gift to the living was to make the outside crowd sit for way too long on straight-backed, cushionless pine pews, sweating in the unair conditioned humidity of un an unseasonably hot late March in southern Texas. The church still had its tiny original windows, which barely opened. I guess electric fans would have violated historic preservation protocols because there sure weren't any running. I was wearing a black wool dress with mid-length sleeves. It was the only dress I owned in black, and I'd be damned if I was gonna buy something new for this. I waved the printed funeral program in front of my face to create a tiny breeze. We weren't even halfway through it yet. Prayer followed eulogy, followed prayer, followed eulogy. Had every single historian of the Roman Empire in the entire nation, aging white men, paunchy and despeckled doll, been invited to wax poetic about Johnny's intellect and academic conquests? On they droned and on and on. How his books had changed his scholarly interpretation of the Roman Empire. What a dynamic presenter he'd been at conferences. What a wry sense of humor. What a great colleague. What a shame, what a shame in the pride of his career, in the prime of his career. It was hard to square these hagiographies with the man I would have characterized a few months ago as a good old boy backslapper type from whom any self-respecting woman would recoil. 
not that he had ever paid me, the lone woman in the department for the first five years of my internment here, the least bit of attention. I'd been hired the year he'd been on leave, he said to me once, not too subtly. He hadn't opposed granting me tenure, though. I'll give him that. He wasn't the only one who could write a paradigm-changing scholarly work on an important era. My Rethinking the American Century, published in my third year here, still sells well for an academic book. The book had made it impossible to deny me tenure. So here I was stuck in this God-fearing vestige of a bygone era of a town where even our decent-sized university didn't offer insulation from a culture both alien and distasteful to me. I had acted rashly in consenting to come here, but then love often makes for intemperate decision-making. I noticed Roz's black, straightened, shoulder-length hair a few rows ahead of me, distinctive in the sea of blonde bobs and male pattern baldness. She still made my heart clench, even though the price I paid to be her love was exorbitant. After tenure, I was ready to declare myself and my love, to come out of that smothering closet that makes liars out of all of us, and I told Roz so. I'm from here, Maddie, she had gasped. My mama would... And you're white, she finished, as if envisioning the racial consequences of our relationship for the first time. End of discussion. Even now, we kept up the pretense of being only vaguely aware of each other, just two colleagues in different departments in a faculty that numbered in the hundreds, never sitting together, never really living together, and certainly no public displays of affection. The feminist movement had been in full swing a decade ago in northern university towns like Madison, where we both earned our doctorates, our lesbian professors, the tenured ones at least, coming out with an audacity that had been impossible only a few years before. Not so in Pine Hill Station. Here we still wore pearls and low heels, shoulder length hair and dresses. Yuck. That tiny unresolved conversation had left Roz so scared she'd run from me, or at least that's what I thought then. I shook my head to clear it of the memories of those terrible months. I'm sure many wondered why I didn't search for a more suitable environment in which to pursue the rest of my academic career. With my broad vowel of Midwestern accent and left of center politics, it was more than obvious I didn't fit in here but I couldn't leave her and she couldn't leave this place. So here I was sweltering in black wool, pretending to honor a man I had thoroughly disliked a few months ago and now loathed. Academics in the same department are joined together in something of an old fashioned marriage till death do us part. And not even then when it came to Johnny and me, a rivulet of sweat ran down the side of my neck. The coffin lid clicked the coffin lid clicked as it closed for the final time. Why anyone would make their family and friends endure an open casket was beyond me, but Johnny always did have an outsized opinion of his tanned and square-jawed good looks. Now the coffin proceeded down the aisle, the bearers members of our university football team with huge shoulders bursting out of their black suits. Then came Johnny's family, his wife, Liz, whom I knew slightly from university functions over the years, and their one daughter, Jenny, in her late teens. Liz looked ethereal and serene in her black Chanel skirt and jacket, her silver blonde hair perfectly quaffed in this heat. Jenny's head bowed and her blonde shoulder length hair swept in front of her face as she and Liz followed the casket down the aisle. Someone dropped their car keys across the aisle from me with a clang and Jenny's head snapped up as if it had been gunshot. I gasped as I saw her face. The memories of last fall began to overwhelm me again. And I'll read a little bit of chapter one from Jenny's point of view. University of Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, late August, 1985. Jenny, hey y'all, I'm your new roommate. I called out, brushing my knuckles against a half open door without looking inside. My Walkman headphones hung around my neck and I could hear Cindy Lauper singing, girls just wanna have fun. 
I still had on my varnish shades and I kept them on. I knew how I'd look to the roommate I'd been assigned, my straw colored hair tied in spiked ponytails all over my head and a red st streak sprayed down the middle of one side, black nail polish, black leather and br stud bracelets, a belted fuck you Frankie t-shirt over a black fake leather mini and black Roman sandals on my feet. I chewed my gum noisily and knocked again. I wanted to get this over with. If I played it cool and mean, whoever they stuck me with this my sophomore year would take one look and ask to get moved like last year model had, or at least leave me alone the rest of the semester. For confidence, I downed a couple of volumes a half an hour before. I would be low key, but tough, real tough. I'd have this girl running scared. No response from inside the room, so I sauntered in. Hey, y'all, it's me, your new roomie. What I saw stopped me cold. They put me in with a black girl. In all the time I spent imagining what kind of doormate I'd wind up with this fall at UW-Madison, I never once thought it might be a black girl. UW was mostly a sea of white faces. At my Christian Academy high school, there had been exactly one black girl, and she was two years older than me, so I'd never spoken to her. In fact, beyond store clerks and waitresses, I'd never spoken to a black girl in my, my age in my life. She looked up slowly from a textbook she'd been paging, paging through. What'd you say, girl? She asked, unfolding her legs and sitting up a bit. I glanced at the number on the door to make sure I had the right room. Yeah, 207, that was a number, all right. I said, I'm your new roommate. This time, it didn't come out so cool. You did not. You said, hey, y'all. You wouldn't be from Texas, would you? She was standing now, a good five inches taller than me. She had on bright pink shorts that set off her long, deep brown legs. This was, wasn't going as I had planned at all. So what if I am? She started laughing and shook her head. I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. You aren't one of those John Birch or debutante types, are you? You think a debutante would go to a school like this? The University of Wisconsin at Madison was a top state school, but it sure wouldn't be where the upper crust in Dallas would send their daughters. Besides, do I look like a debutante? I hurled the words at her, ending my question with a snarl. All the work I'd put into my tough London street look, and she asked me if I'm a debutante. How am I supposed to know what a debutante looks like? You think they let someone like me go to their parties and parade around in one of those frilly chiffon dresses drinking tea with my little fingers stuck out? I just think it's funny that you're from Texas. What's so funny about that? Cuz girl. I'm from Texas too. They put uh, both us foreigners in the same room, sort of like a quarantine so we won't infect their Yankee accents. They put us in the same room because they thought we'd have something in common, both being from Texas at all. and all. Uh, I'll stop there because that's probably about 10. Wow. They go on to be friends, I'll just say. <laughs> all right. The character development is incredible. And down to the Walkman and the music. And wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. And what was the other thing that struck out uh, stuck out to me was um, he he had an ego even in death. It was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much. So now we are on to our reader, Stephen Kastner. Stephen, take it away. mute myself first of all and then i will share the screen this was published in on psychology magazine recently uh i've got to find find what i'm going to read it's right here okay uh share this screen all right, this is a self-portrait that I did and it's called String Theory. Okay, when he was just, when he was a just hatched, tiny firstborn, a nurse attached a bracelet of beads, three blue for boy, followed by seven white cylinders, one for each letter of his new last name engraved on the flats, then three more blue. This was his first possession, tying him to the material world, preventing him from being lost in a sea of fresh babies. 
He and this object have remained together for more than 75 years, his lifetime a string of gains and losses, a player marked by name in the bead game. What lies between a lifetime of assembled objects that seek to define him? Empty space and random selection. His toes flex in socks within well-worn boots, just a few of the body flags flown each day, hair cut and brushed in a particular way, the tools he chooses, the signals he uses to send and receive data, all the makings of an imagined reality. His beliefs outline this box of him and they decide what gets in. But what about the wind, the clouds, the falling rain? His face is wet. He hears thought-shaping music, suffers unexpected notes of pain from disinformatia that skewers his brain. The low beats strike like the sun's rays, a presence that seeps through his skin. The complexity of what he is and the places he has been dealt a single card or four of a kind a dog, a leash, the master's hand, the symphony of sheet music, cast the shadow of a greater plan. Do unseen angels fear the wrath of a watchful divinity, the sublime, divine, magnetic attraction and repulsion, the cosmic glue that keeps atomic souls suspended in borrowed stardust, vibrant in some megaverse. Words evoke the invisible, call forth and beckon with a smoky blend of symbols and unclear responses. Hand gestures, he says, she says, and they reply. Step on a crack, break your mama's back. Step on a nail, put your father in jail. Stare into the sun watch the colors run. There are, he sighs, many ways to calculate how many angels can actually dance on the head of a pin. Are we truly bound by laws that define a physical universe, she says? Isn't there some borderland to the infinite? Consider the quantum realm where time and space bend, they respond, where lawless photons rebel fomenting paradox against Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. What about love and maybe magnets, she ponders in her mind. I have all these unspoken thoughts and verses. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. That was like poetry. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> very, very literary. Thank you so much for sharing that with us tonight. And welcome. Do you want to share a story about rain? There was rain in there. So maybe that is what it is. I have a, uh, no stories about rain, except, you know, that it rained today. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and I woke up at one o'clock when the rain started falling on my metal roof. That's a nice sound, isn't it? It was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And your art is really beautiful. Thanks. Nice, nice to see. Yeah. All yeah. right. Next, we have Liz Gaffaro. And Liz, take it away. Hi. My memory about rain is um, lying on my camp cot reading um, when it was raining at our family camp at Paul Stream uh, up in the Northeast Kingdom. And we had all the windows open. So, you know, as I lay there and read all day, um, all you could smell was forest scented rain. And that's, that's an image that has stayed with me. It was really wonderful. Camp's gone now though. I'm going to read an excerpt from a story that just came out this month uh, called The Chet Arthur Five uh, Play Jeffersonville. And the basic situation is that um, the point of view character, Sam, 
has been pulled out of algebra class by his mother because mother's boyfriend um, is too drunk to drive. So she needs Sam to chauffeur them around. So I'll read the excerpt and then I will put the link to the rest of the story in the chat. So the Cheddar Arthur Five play Jeffersonville. When they arrived at the sap bucket and Sam saw the Volvos parked outside, he knew they had the wrong bar or the wrong information or something. Are you sure this is the place? He said to Lorraine who was buttering, buttoning her coat. Of course I'm sure. She opened the car door and scrambled out. I think I'm stupid or something? She continued talking as she pushed the driver's seat forward and reached into the back to help Jimmy out. This place has been here for 20 years. I know where the hell I am, don't I, Jimmy? Listen to your mother, Jimmy said as he followed Lorraine out of the car. She knows where to go. She wouldn't steer us wrong. All right, Sam said, not wanting Jimmy to get started. I'll stay in the car and wait for you here. You will not, Lorraine said. It's too cold. You'll freeze out here in the car. And anyways, I want you to listen to this band. This is a good band. You like good music. You come in with us and listen to the band and we'll dance, won't we, Jimmy? She stumbled and clutched Jimmy's arm. The thin soles of her high heels slipped on the icy surface of the parking lot. Jimmy lost his balance and they both went down laughing. Shit, Sam said. He locked the car, put the keys in his front pocket and picked up Lorraine and Jimmy who were still laughing. Shit, he said again, this time to himself. As soon as they walked into the bar, Sam knew for certain they were in the wrong place. The band warming up on the tiny stage was a bunch of aging hippies. One was leaning over a stand-up bass, tuning it. Lorraine found a table near the small dance floor in front of the band and they got themselves settled. Lorraine laughing and repeating herself to no one in particular, Jimmy just sitting there mouthing his cigar and looking glazed. When the waitress came to take their order, Lorraine asked her how they had got the wood inside the plastic table. The waitress informed her it was the other way around. Well, it don't look that way to me, Lorraine said. She and Jimmy ordered a, picture, a pitcher of beer and Sam ordered a Coke. He thought briefly about going out to the car and getting his books so that he could do his algebra homework for tomorrow, but the bar was so noisy he knew that he would never be able to concentrate. To his dismay, Sam saw that his mother was crying again, loudly, wetly, profusely. Her nose had turned red and her cheeks had mottled. He hissed across the table, what is your problem? Why are you crying? Jimmy said, it's my fault, my fault. I asked her to marry me. I was just joking, you understand, but I meant it, I shouldn't have done it. Sam knew that the only thing to do was to distract them one way or another. Bringing up the fact that Jimmy was already married was pointless. Sam was sure that neither one of them knew what the other was talking about anyway. Jimmy didn't know why Lorraine was crying and Lorraine didn't know why Jimmy kept asking her to marry him. Lorraine was still sniffling and jo Jimmy now had tears in his eyes. I've been hurt, Lorraine explained to Jimmy. I've been away too long and I come back hurt and I don't want you to know about it because we were such good friends in high school, such good friends. You're a good man, Jimmy, and you have a good wife and a good marriage and two good sons. Me, I got no husband, no marriage. I'll never marry again, never, it's too much pain. I got four little kids with no daddy, a big baby, so damn foolish he stays in trouble all the time. Two grown up boys with shit for brains that don't have half a brain between them, and Sammy. Sammy is my only son, my only boy. He is so good to me. She began sobbing loudly. Jimmy was looking a little pale and that distracted Lorraine's attention for a few minutes. Would he puke or wouldn't he puke? Sam assumed that he wouldn't, or if he did, he would have the decency to make it outside first. He was not a puke on people's shoes drunk. The band was warming up under the soft glow of muted lights over the small platform that served as a stage. When they were through with the plunks on the bass and the honks on the saxophone and the blats on the trumpet, another aging hippie, this one dressed in faded bell bottoms and an embroidered muslin shirt, 
came out from behind the bar and went up to the microphone, tapping it with his finger. If he said, testing, testing, like some dipshit school principal, Sam decided he was going to get up and leave. He would just go out, sit in Jimmy's car, turn on the dome light, and work on his algebra problems. Yes, please put the link. Okay. Because we were halfway in there. We got to put the rest. Thank you. I loved the crying profusely and wetly. <laughs> well Thank you. Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. Next, we have George Longnecker, our featured writer at the end of tonight's session. So, George, take it away and share with okay. us. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. I've got to hear the end. Got to read the ending for that. Uh, Oh, rain, I'm George Long, and I, uh, rain memory. What I'm going to read takes place in Colorado. I was re remembering a time when I was camped in Rocky Mountain National Park, Sand Beach Lake, the back country site. It's been beautiful and sunny than the, the day before, starry day, and I woke up and it had turned to rain, which turned to wet snow on my tent. I was I was prepared, prepared to be. So this is a nonfiction memoir piece. It's forthcoming in Evening Street Review. License plates and prisoners. In January 1977, I was hired as a temporary worker in the Colorado Department of Motor Vehicles Denver office. Colorado was replacing their red, white, and blue. 76 plates with the Rocky Mountains silhouetted in green. All day, they stood behind a counter and handed customers their new 77 plates. The job was tedious, but predictable, and we temps got along with the full-time staff. It was a paycheck, better than unemployment after my seasonal city parks and recreation job had ended in the autumn. I'd moved from Vermont for a couple of years. Though Denver was gritty, I often got out to hike in the Rockies. Coincidentally, I'd had a small license plate collection since I was a kid. It was another slow January day of passing out plates. Then my next truck plate came through with a, with a message from Black Market on the back. Before handing the plates to the customer, I always opened the envelope to make sure the two matched each other and the number and registration certificate. The plates were made by prisoners from Colorado Correctional Industries at the State Penitentiary in Canyon City. The message was from a prisoner who said he was lonely and wanted someone to write him. It was signed with Mike, his last name, his five-digit prison, prisoner number and the address of the penitentiary. I asked the customer if he was okay taking the plates, and he said, sure. I can't imagine this happening today. I jotted down the address <clears throat> and handed him the plates. While Mike's plea went on somebody's truck, I decided to write him. It had been a historic month. President Gerald Ford had lost the 1976 election and on January 20th, turned over the presidency to Jimmy Carter. But three days earlier on January 17th, news from a prison in Utah got as much publicity as the coming inaugural. Execution resumed in the US when convicted murderer Gary Gilmore gave up the field and was executed by firing squad. A week later, a letter arrived from Canyon City. Mike was doing time in a tough prison, making Colorado license plates. He was not famous or notorious like Gilmore. He thanked me for writing and told me a little bit about himself. He was from Cortez, Colorado, and rode horses, a cowboy as he described himself. He had listed in the US Marine Corps seven or eight years earlier, but deserted rather than go to Vietnam. After deserting, he lived in the Philippines for a year. He returned to Colorado the next year. 
and the time since had never been caught for desertion. A couple of years before he wrote me, he'd been in a county jail for a minor crime, a bar fight. At the jail, he assaulted a cop and escaped. So in 1975, he landed at Canyon City, where he'd be until 1980, 32 more months. Ironically, he might have been better off getting court-martialed for desertion and probably would have served less time. He seemed like a regular guy and admitted he was hot-tempered. Mike told me about license plate manufacturing. He said that one prisoner lost two fingers in a plate standing machine. I wondered if they cleaned up the bloody plates and sent them on to our DMV office. Our letters continued back and forth over the spring. Mike was a good writer and told interesting stories. Canyon City was a violent, dangerous place. The prison was home to unknown as well as famous convicts. Mike met Joseph Corbett Jr. doing life for the kidnapping and murder of Adolf Coors, the third 17 years earlier. Unfortunately, I lost touch with Mike when I moved back to Vermont. I sent him my new address, but never heard from him again. However, my pen pal friendship with Mike led to other things. Eight years later in 1985, I wrote to a Vermont man incarcerated on Texas death row. Robert Drew's co-defendant had confessed to being the sole killer and exonerated Drew. They'd been hitchhiking and the co-defendant had killed the driver. In Texas, a public defender is unlikely to get an acquittal in a capital murder case, even if the defendant is innocent. Whatever happened, even two good appellate attorneys had not been able to get through a new trial. I wrote to him for nine years and visited him three times. Every death row prisoner has a three-digit number, like those prestigious low number license plates. Drew had number 755, which had to be on every piece of mail. He sent me drawings and gifts, intricately made balsa wood knickknack boxes, sent us a card when our daughter was born. I still have two of the boxes. On our four visits, I was on one side of a glass cage with a wire mesh open and drew on the other. Life on death row is a countdown to either a successful appeal or execution. Drew, by then 35, was executed in 1984. I was there to see him die. Meanwhile, on my visits, I'd met another death row prisoner, Calvin Jerry Burdine, number 758. While Burdine had not committed murder, under the Texas law of parties, he was equally guilty of an accomplice. He was articulate, funny, and determined to win his appeals. He sent away for clock kits and crafted detailed frames of fabric and balls that were on the clock. On October 7, 1987, Verdine came within 13 minutes of execution. He was strapped to the gurney with needles in his arms when he got a stay. He's written a memoir about it. It took years, but Verdine eventually won his appeal in the famous sleeping lawyer case. His public defender had fallen asleep at the defense table each afternoon. Verdine got off death row, but hasn't gotten out. He plea bargained and got a life sentence in 2000. He lives in the Telford unit of the Texas Department of Corrections and is doing his 40th year. Every two years, he applies for parole. I've written him for years now and talked to him most every week. He's taken college but classes in prison. Now he spends his days reading, writing, listening to the radio, playing games on his tablet, 
and watching TV in the day room. People may ask why I'd want to be friends with convicted criminals. These are people who have made horrendous mistakes if they're guilty. If they are ever going to return to society, contact and support from people outside of prison is essential for their rehabilitation. These are men who lead lonely lives of isolation and need a window to the outside world. I went on to create a college course on these issues called Crime and Punishment. My students read about murder, domestic abuse, recidivism, wrongful conviction, and more. I went on to get paid for teaching about these issues while Jerry has languished in prison and brought his ex here. I never knew what happened to Mike, but hope he went on to live a productive, happy life. I went on to collect license plates from all over the world. Though I only knew one person who made license plates, I still think of the prisoner's hands that touch the plates in my collection. Prisoners are lonely people who have damaged lives, some of whom caused terrible tragedy and who hope someday to be free. How ironic that some of these prisoners who cannot travel cannot drive, cannot hold paid jobs, made license plates for cars and trucks, vehicles that carry people to work, school, vacation, and across the continent. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. I will never look at a license plate the same way again. You know, thinking about the finger that was lost and thinking about these men. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. You're welcome. And thank you all readers tonight what a really lovely way to spend an evening thank you i'll mention right now that in july it's a saturday july 15th we're planning the into the words event that will be happening up at jerry johnson's in the northeast kingdom so please mark your calendars and if anybody here would like to be a teacher and would like to teach a course about a 45 minute to an hour course up there we would love to hear from you and members who teach for 45 minutes to an hour get to go to the event for free so if you are interested in that i will put my email in the chat and please email me and let me know if you have anything that you would like to teach to other writers in the league okay thank you everybody and do have a wonderful evening thanks, thank everyone. You, thanks take care thanks everyone Good night. Good night. Good night.